Praise the Lord. It's a blessing to see you all again this Lord's Day and to gather together to worship the living God, the God of glory, the God of all creation. Uh, I do want to mention, I, I know it was already announced, and I, I want to make you all aware, again, just to extend a warm invitation toward you concerning our fellowship meal after the service and in, in commemoration for Thanksgiving. And so we would be uh, we would be thrilled if you would join us if you were otherwise not. I uh, just want to encourage you, um, in no uncertain terms, to join us, and uh, it will be a time that will bless you tremendously. All right. So with that said, let's turn our Bibles to the Book of Philippians as we continue our series, Philippians chapter one. Philippians chapter 1. We're going to pick up right where we left off last week. We, we, uh, we stopped in, uh, I think it was at the end of verse 20. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, at the end of verse 20. We're going to be looking at verses 19 and verses, uh, verse 20 this week in Philippians chapter 1. And uh, it's been a tremendous joy and a blessing to, to work through what we've seen, even though we've seen very little, only 20 verses, or this week it'll finally be 20 verses. Uh, but I, I trust and I know that uh, the rest of the book will be a delight to your souls. It's been to mine. So the Apostle Paul, in, in Philippians chapter 1, in verse 20 he writes this, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And I'll actually read verse 18 to give a little bit of context there. He says, What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. Now verse 19. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Now if you would, let's go to the Lord in prayer, asking that He would bless the preaching of this word. Father, I thank You, especially during this season of, uh, of Thanksgiving. I thank you for the fellowship of the saints and for the opportunity that we have to meet together this morning in this public setting and to lift up praises to your name, to hear the, the psalms read, to hear a pastoral prayer offered, and to now listen to the word of God, to now see what you have to say. For you are speaking. We know that you speak, but we know that it is through your word you speak through the truth of your word. In fact, that is where we go to find revelation from you. It has already been given. All that is needed for life and godliness is there for us in the scriptures. And so we rejoice and we express our gratitude toward you that you have made these things so readily available for us. It is my prayer, Father, that you would bless the truth of your word upon the hearts and minds of your people. That it would be used in our sanctification, and our conformity to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we are mindful that there perhaps are souls in this room that are unredeemed. That are not covered by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And it is for them we also pray that they would experience the saving grace of the gospel this day, and they would not leave until that is resolved, until their standing before you is one that is right, is one that is in Christ, that they can say with the Apostle Paul, yes, I am in Christ, and that he himself is my salvation, whom shall I fear? Father, I pray chiefly that Christ, our Lord, our Redeemer, the King of glory, is glorified. That he, has received, that he receives glory, that he receives praise and adoration in our time of worship. And we pray all these things in his name. Amen. Amen. The title of this morning's sermon is Prevailing in All Things. Prevailing in All Things. Uh, I don't usually like to share life stories. 
uh, because I, I know that it's a propensity of a lot of preachers to get up and give a whole story uh, or like a, a biography, you could say an autobiography. And it's really unfortunate because it serves to exalt the preacher a lot of times. But I think it's helpful from time to time to mention a life story that illustrates a biblical truth. There's one I'd like to share with you that I think beautifully illustrates what, uh, what Paul is discussing here in Philippians chapter 1. Uh, it was in May of 2012 that uh, on a summer's day, my father informed us that he was not feeling well. He said that he uh, felt a little nauseous and lightheaded, so he had made the decision to step outside and uh, to get some fresh air. Um, but in an unfortunate turn of providence, he actually collapsed in our sight, and um, I thought in that moment that I was going to watch my father die before me. In fact, I was convinced, we didn't know what had happened to him, uh, because he fell down and began to convulse on the ground and, and, and blew purple. And, you know, I'm, I'm thinking he's had a heart attack, you know, and we're not going to see him again. Uh, it was a terrifying moment, uh, but we do know, you know, the, 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 the first responders made their way there, and God willing, he, uh, he recovered from that particular episode, and um, but they wanted to do some testing on his brain because they determined that he had had a, a grand mal seizure, which is a full body seizure, and uh, that he uh, that it was a very traumatic experience for his body, and that there was something wrong in his brain. There was an issue, and uh, and so he went in for some testing and, and uh, MRIs and things of the like, and they discovered that uh, he had a malignant brain tumor behind his right uh, right ear, and even to this day, it's a, a, a something that my family and I deal with. But by the grace of God, it hasn't grown. Uh, over the, the six years or so that he's dealt with it, over six years now, and, um, and God has used it in, in many ways to bless our family, and, uh, and, and I know that God's used it to mature my parents in the faith, uh, but I bring up this story because uh, the perspective of my parents is something that has encouraged me beyond what I can say, um, because they have a bright perspective on my father's condition. They have a correct perspective about these things. They really say, they really have said from the beginning, as Paul says here, that whether in life or death, whether this ends in a, a, a good uh, place or not for us, we prevail and we are victorious in Christ. In fact, I recall at some point, I don't know when it was, somewhere along the line, I mean, my dad and I had a conversation about it. And he told me of a prayer that he prayed um, before one of his, his MRIs. And I remember him, him praying and he, he told me he prayed specifically for a healing. And he knew, he said, that he had that healing. He knew that God would give him healing. He said he didn't know whether it would be on earth or it would be in heaven. He didn't know. And Paul likewise here in this, in this uh, dangerous situation, not knowing really whether it will end in his death or not, whether this situation will end uh, in his favor or not, he can actually say it will always end in my favor. And so likewise, my parents and myself concerning my father's condition can say what the end is we do not know. What, uh, what lies ahead, we do not know. And there's certainly a temptation to be fearful, yet we can say that he himself is victorious in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he himself will be healed one day. And likewise, I think that is a beautiful illustration of Paul's attitude in prison. What have we seen through chapter 1 of Philippians so far? Paul has a really good attitude, a good perspective in terms of his situation that he's in. And really drawing out the conclusions of his imprisonment, saying, I do not know how long my life will last. I do not know the day of my death. I do not know how this particular situation will turn out, as he says in verse 19. But whether in life or in death, Christ the Lord will be exalted in my body, whether in life or in death. And so that's what we're going to consider today. We're going to look at two things. And, it's for, and it break, these two verses break out quite easily into two points. One being the fact of Paul's condition in verse 19. And then secondly, we're going to look at the implications of that, of that fact of Paul's condition. And the implications he draws out from his situation. And so let's consider those things together. Looking at verse 19, let's consider the fact of Paul's circumstances. What does he say in verse 19? He says, For I know that this will turn out. And we'll just stop right there because we have to remind ourselves, what is this? Well, what is this situation he's, he's referencing? And we've done this a couple of weeks already. But let's go back and, and read and remind ourselves what we've seen already. Verse 12. Verse 12 of chapter 1. What does Paul say? He says, Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that it, my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has been become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard, 
and to everyone else. So we find Paul here giving testimony to the fact that he's imprisoned, but that God is using, nonetheless using his imprisonment to, uh, to propagate, to, to share the gospel with those around him. Verse 14, And that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more core courage to speak the word of God without fear. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ, even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. We saw how Paul struggled with this, the hypocrites preaching the gospel that he preached, but to do, doing it in such a way, and doing it with the intention of, of causing Paul uh, harm. He says, verse 16, The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaimed Christ out of selfish ambition, rather than, pure, than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. Verse 18, What then only in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I, re I rejoice. And then he says at the end of verse 18, Yes, and I will rejoice. And so he's emphatically saying, My situation is not the best. And I'm encountering difficulties, but in this I still will rejoice. And he gives reason concerning that because he does say Christ is still being proclaimed by the hypocrites. The gospel is being, being brought to unbelievers, even though uh, God is using his prophets, hypocrites, to bring about that end. And then he gives us another reason, as we just read in verse 19 and verse 20, as to why he's rejoicing. Because he doesn't know what lies ahead of him. He doesn't know what, what, what's to come. But he can say that he is excitedly awaiting the fact that in whatever happens, Christ will be glorified in him. Paul has what we would say an eternal perspective. He realizes that this life is so fickle. It comes and it goes. It is so brief. It is succinct. It's here for a moment and then it's gone. The scripture describes it elsewhere as a vapor of smoke. It's, one, it's here one moment, and then the next it is gone. But Paul realizes from that internal perspective, the eventual end. As he continues in verse 19, look at with me. He says, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. So Paul realizes he's going to be delivered. There's, there's not a contingency. This isn't based off of a, something that might or might not happen. This is based off of the very character of God. That God is always working all things to the end that His people might be preserved. That their good might come out of it. He says, For my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Christ. It's interesting to note, though, as a, as a side note, but it's nonetheless important, and you ought to be aware of it, there's only one Greek word behind the two words, my deliverance. And it's the Greek word soteria. It's where we get the, the term soteriology. And that's the study of salvation. Soteria is one of the words that's used in the New Testament for salvation. You're saved from sin. And it's used uh, many, many times when we talk about being saved from sin. Being saved from the wrath of God. And notice there's no Greek word, there's no personal pronoun that Paul uses in the Greek there. He just says, uh, we, could, we could translate it like this, that, it is, it, that, this, that this situation will turn out for salvation. So it's thought, and this is, a, this is a, another interpretation of the text, that he's not necessarily talking about his own deliverance, but rather for the salvation of others. Because as we mentioned from the context there, we know that he was struggling with hypocrites who were preaching Christ. And so he says, even in this, God's going to use that to bring salvation to people. God's going to use a, people who are preaching the gospel out of, out of ill motives, out of wicked motives, but He's still going to use them to bring Christ's message to unbelievers. John Gill, the famous Bible commentator, says, Or to salvation, to the salvation of others, that is, the preaching of Christ by these men, though designed by them to hurt the apostle, yet he knew that by the power and grace of God it should be made useful to the conversion of and for the salvation of many souls. And this was matter of rejoicing to him. And you wonder, you ask yourself, why would the Bible translators didn't choose the, the personal pronoun to throw in there? My deliverance. Because as we discuss and we consider the context, especially in verse 20, it would seem to indicate that Paul is talking about himself. He's talking about his own specific deliverance. And this is a position I would take uh, with a great measure of confidence. That Paul is, is, is talking about really his own deliverance. And highlighting to us the fact that, as I've already mentioned, and whatever happens in the end, 
he himself will be saved. And it's interesting, he mentions here, he says that his deliverance is what? Through, verse 19, through your prayers. And that just shows for us, and that puts on display in a, in a glorious way the power of prayer. That God in His providence uses the prayers of His people. He hears the prayers of His people. In fact, I was just speaking to a, a dear friend last night, and um, I was sharing with that friend that um, God is pleased to hear our prayers. God is pleased to answer our prayers. And therefore, he invites us to pray. In fact, it's, it's indicated later in Scripture uh, by the Apostle James in James 5.16. He says, pray for one another. There's the imperative. We are to pray so that you may be healed. So, so James recognizes what? That prayer procures effect. It brings about effect. And then he says, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. It will bring about great things. God has, uh, and we think about church history, uh, any time before a great revival has happened, and we think about the greatest revival in church history being the Reformation, God has always sent His saints ahead, as it were, of that event to pray on behalf of it. He's always sent people ahead to pray. And that's why I mentioned to you all the importance of uh, us praying for our, our town, our local community here in Ware Shoals. If we seek re Reformation in Ware Shoals, if we long for revival then we must pursue uh, the, the, the foundation, you ought to say, for revival. That's prayer. We, we, we are to soak this place in prayers. Because it works. Because Paul connects his deliverance directly with the prayers of the Philippians. And then he also mentions the, the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And so here we have also the Holy Spirit's uh, ministry in the life of the Christian being highlighted for us. His intimate working in our lives. And we know that He is the one specifically who is attributed in Scripture with the act of sanctification. He's the one who's, who's, who's most intimately involved in that. In fact, uh, Scripture describes us as being given the Spirit as a seal, as a pledge for our inheritance. He is, he is in us. He dwells in us. In fact, we are called the what? The, the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are the dwelling place of God, our bodies, that is. Because he abides in us. And so Paul recognizes that he himself, in this lonely condition, you can imagine being in prison, wasn't the most exciting thing, probably not the most social experience, but he recognizes that the Holy Spirit, that the third person of the Trinity, is there, and he is working. Though Paul is experiencing a, a great weight upon his shoulders, though he is... Um, Perhaps even a feeling of, over, of being overwhelmed is, is starting to engulf him. He nonetheless realizes that, uh, that God will uphold him. God is his strength and his salvation. In fact, there's a common phrase that's used in evangelical circles. God will never give you more than you can bear. And you've probably heard that before, maybe seen it on Facebook or something. I just think that's ridiculous because God almost always gives us more than we can bear. Almost always. But he never gives us more than, than he can bear. You see that? It's interesting. God can't make a rock too, uh, too, too big for him to pick up, you know, as it were. God, God cannot uh, so work a situation that it, it, it spins out of control. We're, we're not open theists. Uh, hopefully we're Calvinists. Hopefully we're all Calvinists here. Hopefully we all believe in the sovereignty of God, not only over salvation, but all aspects of life. That God is in total control of every event in history. And all of it is in, in accordance with His sovereign will. And in our lives, in our very present situations, I know we all feel that to an extent as Paul has felt, or is feeling there in this text. We've all felt that before, that, that sense of being overwhelmed. But we can, like Paul, take refuge in the fact that, as the psalmist says, where can I go from your spirit? Where, where, can, I flee? where can I go that I would be away from God? It's nowhere. Even for the wicked, we know God is imminent. Even when it comes to the, 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 the wicked, God is close even to the wicked. But there's a very special sense in which God is close to His people. It sounds ridiculous to say, but nothing's too hard for God. And something simple as that, we, we will often act in, um, in contradiction to, unfortunately. And so sometimes we find ourselves behaving as, as atheists. We, we become practical atheists. 
And we have to remind ourselves of these truths. Uh, that we have the joy that Paul has. Because what do we see in verse 18? He is rejoicing. He's rejoicing. And he's emphatically rejoicing. He doesn't say it once. He says, yes, I will rejoice because of these things. God's power, God's strength cannot be exhausted. He doesn't get fatigued and need to recharge. In fact, what does the Baptist Catechism say? Question 8, what is God? The answer is, God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in His being, wisdom, power, underline power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. This is what we believe, brethren. That the, the power of God is something that is infinite. It cannot be numbered. And it will not have a limit to it. Now let's consider, and going to verse 20, uh, the implications that Paul draws out of this situation. The, the, the thoughts that he has concerning this. One he says is, we will never be put to shame. Because in verse 20 he says, according to my earnest expectation and hope. That I will not be put to shame in anything. In any situation. And that, that is something that's so... It, it grasps our curiosity because you, you remember and we recall, and you've heard me mention this many times, God's people have always been on the, the receiving end of, 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 of hardship and persecution and difficulty. We've always been in the minority in, in, the, sense of, uh, in the sense that we are, we are being, we're being uh, persecuted by society, the world, the flesh, and the devil... The world hates us because it hated the God of glory that made it. And yet Paul says, we will not be ashamed in anything. In fact, we can say it like this, whatever happens, we win. We win. You know, there's a lot of talk in prosperity gospel circles, especially from... You know, those preachers like Joel Osteen and things of the like, and they, they talk about being victorious in Christ, you know, and, and your best life now and things of the like. And it's unfortunate because they really hijack those terms that we could have used. They, they abuse those things and, and they make it and, and warp it to really mean in this life we're going to, to be victorious. In this life, we're promised only hardship, only difficulty, only tribulation, only trial, only persecution. Paul says all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But in that, we say with Paul, we are not going to be put to shame in anything. Paul wrote about this idea in greater depth elsewhere in the New Testament, so let's go there together. Romans chapter 8. You may be familiar with Romans 8. It's one of my favorite chapters in the New Testament. In fact, Romans 8, I've been, I've been heard, it, it's been given the nickname, the Holy Spirit's chapter, because it's, it's, it's all about His ministry in the life of a Christian. But I'm going to go to Romans chapter 8, beginning of verse 26, and read the, all the way to the end of the chapter. Because I think it's significant. Paul really uh, expands on what we just saw in Philippians there, here. Verse 26 of Romans 8. Paul says, in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he, who, and he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because He intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God to those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son, so that He would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom He predestined, He also called. And these whom He called, He also justified. And these whom He justified, He also glorified. That's us, by the way. We're the objects of this divine love that is, that is shown in the Gospel. In verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? And who's he writing to? Remember this, he's writing to the believers at Rome. These Christians had already, and were going to experience, extreme persecution. And these Christians were like at the epicenter of this earthquake of persecution. And yet he says this. Verse 32, He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him over for us all, how will He not also with Him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? 
God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God. Who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through Him who loved us. If you have a highlighter or an opinion, you want to just underline overwhelmingly. Because that's not a word we often use in our vernacular. But it's nonetheless true and wonderful to consider. He says, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So this is the perspective of the Apostle Paul. That really, whether I'm dead or alive... Whether there's a sword at my throat or I'm being exalted for, for standing for the gospel. In, in whatever situation I find myself in, whatever state of existence I'm in, I can say that nothing can, can remove me from the love of God that is revealed in Jesus Christ. That He Himself has by His own blood purchased me. That I am His possession. The scripture says the church is the bride of Christ. And that He loves her with a love that uh, we could not understand. And that He's jealous for her and that He will have her to Himself for all eternity. And therefore Paul could stand with such confidence as he does there in Philippians 1. That really He's not worried. Really the, the worry, the fear that, that is certainly, uh, we would think so, so closely attached to that situation, is dispelled for Him in His mind. And He can have joy. Because really there's two possibilities for Paul. Going back to verse 20. He says, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now as always be exalted in my body. Whether by life or by death. The Greek word for all boldness is parousia. And it means all speech, freedom, boldness. Forwardness. This isn't something that causes Paul to be a coward. It, it causes Paul to be bold as a lion for the gospel's sake. In fact, it, it's, with, it's with this confidence that the, Paul, the apostle had that, that we are to go out into the world. You know, today's the first day of the week, brethren. Not, not, not Monday. Today is. And we're preparing for another week out in this world. It's hostile. But we also can walk out with confidence. Confide. With faith. That Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in us. That, that is the end. That's the grand end of our lives. I, 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 you've heard me say it so many times. So many times. It's the glory of God. That's the end of our existence. And so really we can say, whether it's life for us or death for us, they're both good. Because Christ put death to death. Jesus in His death on the cross... End in death for all those who believe in Him. In fact, I think it was John Owen who wrote a, a work called uh, The Death of Christ and the Death of Death. And it's so true. That really for us, it is merely a, a, a doorway. What's the worst thing that can happen to somebody? You think about it. You lose all your money, finances, or you, you, know, you, you lose an asset, you lose a family member. Well, really the worst thing in, ter in terms of statistically speaking is actually to die, to lose your life. It is. But for the Christian, the very worst thing that could happen to us is merely a threshold over which we pass into eternal glory. In fact, just to keep our sermon contained within Pauline writing, within Paul's writings, let's go also somewhere else, just very briefly, 1 Corinthians 15, to see a theology of, of death being destroyed in, in, in greater depth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Verse 54. 1 Corinthians 15 is a long chapter. Uh, I think we looked at it um, last Lord's Day evening when I was uh, doing evangelism training. And we looked at the first portion of that chapter as Paul's talking about the essence of the gospel message. 
Well, from that, he draws out some implications. One being that because of the gospel, because Jesus died for sinners, sinners do not have to die for their sin. And so in verse 54, 1 Corinthians 15, or excuse me, I'm sorry. Let's see, yes, verse 54, my apologies. He says, But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have, will have put on immortality, then we will come. Then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Verse 55, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. As we think about the apostles specifically, Paul and John and Peter and men of the like, as, uh, as they faced martyrdom, as they, they stood in, in front of, um, you think about some of the, the legends of church history, they stood in, in front of a cross perhaps, you think about Peter, it, it's said that he was crucified upside down, as they're standing before there and they're facing death, they're looking death in the eye, you can say. Yet with that, and in light of that situation, yet they with confidence know that that's merely something through which they pass to something so much greater, so much more wonderful, that Paul doesn't even attempt to give in detail how heaven is like. He says, no, eye has, or no ear has heard, no eye has seen those things for which God has prepared His people. We just cannot comprehend the greatness of heaven. And to enter into it, we merely must pass through this brief, somewhat painful, the brief thing called death. Going back to verse 20 of Philippians chapter 1, he says, Christ will even now as always be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. What is Paul's focus? Even though he's writing about himself, who is Paul, Paul focusing on? It's Christ. We, we have to get out of our, our, our self-centered frame of mind and become Christocentric, Christ-centered, truly, to the extent that we forget about ourselves. In fact, Paul talks about this later in Ephesians, uh, excuse me, Philippians chapter 2, when he says we must be uh, mindful of others. We must think of ourselves as less and think of others more. We must, uh, we must be humble. We must uh, possess true humility. And where does that come from? It is really not, not, not just, it's, it doesn't come from really saying, I'm going to look at others. It really comes from looking at the Lord Jesus Christ, who himself humbled himself and laid down his life as a ransom for many. So it is the glory of Christ that we are to, we are to keep our eyes on. And if that is our focus and our hope and our delight, I can tell you, brethren, that is a great thing to focus on and to look to. Forget about ourselves. Forget about this world and the pleasures contained therein, the passing pleasures of sin. And let us look to the eternal Christ. What is a, a Hebrews 13.5? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Every beautiful object on the face of this earth, nice cars, jewelry, beautiful women, Whatever you, 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 your fancy is to, to look about, guess what? Those things will all pass away. They will all be burned up. But the Lord Jesus Christ, His beauty is an eternal beauty. And it will not, it will not alter. It will not change. And it is infinite. It is infinite, as we saw there in the Baptist Catechism. So, brethren, be encouraged. Thank God for these truths. And look forward... Not forward to your life of difficulty that still awaits you. Look forward beyond that. And say, whether by life or by death, Christ will be exalted in my body. Have that, that, that eternal perspective of Paul and your joy will, will, will stay streamlined. It won't go up and down. Because the people in the world, their joy is contingent upon their life experience. And unfortunately, even many of our friends who are caught up under gospel, prosperity gospel teaching and preaching, they're in that same boat. Their joy is just, it's just up and down. It's spiking. But we don't have to be in such a state. It can, can stay, it can stay consistent because our God changes not. And if you are an unbeliever, if you can't have confidence, if you don't have confidence concerning these things, concerning the, 
the sovereignty of God working in your favor and working to your benefit. If you're concerned concerning these things, if you have fear that you yourself are lost, God gave you that, uh, that will to live, you could say. And I could say perhaps even that fear might be a healthy fear, might be a legitimate fear that you are to attend to. And to see to it that you are reconciled to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There is one mediator between God and man, and it is the man Jesus Christ. On my way to church this morning, I passed by a Roman Catholic church, and I thought about that. They don't believe that Christ is the only mediator. But you must believe that if you were to have eternal life. So that's what we've seen here in Philippians chapter 1. That Paul has this, this perspective this perspective of, we will prevail. We will prevail in all things. And how can a man as Paul, who, who killed Christians, have such a confidence? Because he believed this simple fact. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am the foremost. Christ did. He entered into time. And took upon himself that humble state and died upon Calvary's cross, bearing the wrath of God for the sins of humanity and was raised to life on the third day. And he exists in heaven now and he is exalted and being worshipped and praised and he is king and his kingdom is growing and he invites and he calls all to himself, all who will come, have life, believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, as the Apostle Paul said. And his righteousness will be imputed to you. Your sins will be washed away. Because our God is a God of grace. And a God of tremendous, monumentous mercy. And so we can say, for the Apostle Paul, to God be the glory. Uh, as he says in Romans, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Let's pray. Oh God, these truths are so weighty. I pray that they would penetrate. They would penetrate us, that they would, they would reach to the very core of our being, to the innermost man, and that we would be blessed by them. And I pray that now that we've heard your word <laughs> preached, as we've looked at these things, we pray, as Paul says, whether by life or death, you are glorified in our bodies. In Christ's name. Amen.